Exodus chapter 20, Exodus chapter 20, verse 13. Continuing on our study of the Ten Commandments. Today, commandment number six. Commandment number six, Exodus 20 and verse 13. The Bible says, Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not kill. This morning I want to give you some thoughts on God's value of life. God's value of life. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for our time together. We pray, Lord, that you'd add your blessing to your word. Lord, help us for the next few minutes just to be able to put away the thoughts that we have that we brought in this morning, the distractions, and help us to focus for the next few minutes on your word this morning. And Father, we'll be careful to thank you for all that you accomplish in our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Recently I... uh, was listening to a uh, radio program and I was listening to this uh, man that was talking about abortion and I heard the commentator uh, was interviewing a pro-abortion person and uh, as I listened to the interview between this Christian commentator and the pro-abortion advocate in the discussion the commentator asked the advocate of abortion he said this he said to her he said when is life viable when is life viable and she answered by saying that a baby in the womb was only a bunch of cells and not a human being. Furthermore, it's not viable human being until it was able to sustain its own life apart from its mother without assistance. And that was her position on uh, a baby in the womb. And the commentator then said to the, the lady, he said this, he said, if you were in a car accident, and we're unable to sustain your life without life support or the help of medical staff or others. So what you're saying to me, if I get you correctly, is this, that you're okay with us sucking your brain out through a tube. And that lady didn't have much to say. Because that's the hypocrisy of abortion rights ad- advocates. Because after all, you know, you're no, no longer valuable to society or... Uh, You're no longer valuable under her definition, but that's the hypocrisy that we see when we talk about these things with the world today. The sixth commandment gives God's heart on the value of human life. And the reason human life is important to God is because humans are made in God's own image. Genesis chapter 1, verse 26 and 27 tells us that God created both male and female. And what God created, He has chosen to work through. And one of the greatest arguments against this transgender movement that we have out here in life today is this. Uh, If transgender people, so-called, it's a violation of God's creation. Because the Bible says God created male and female. The Bible says that God created man in His own image. You know, say what you will, transgender people are me-focused in my estimation. From all the arguments that I hear, from all the things that I see, they're, they're me-focused. Homosexual people, sodomites, according to the Word of God, are all about selfishness. You, you say, wait a minute, preacher, I, I know some sodomite couples and some sodomite people, and they're very nice people. Well, that may be so. But if they were left to themselves, we would run out of people in a few generations. See, they're not able to produce life in their relationship. The only thing that that couple can do is satisfy each other. If the Sodomites had their way, humanity would be extinct within a few generations. But God's plan for life did not include working through gay couples, contrary to what the world will tell you this morning. God will never work through a corruption of His creation. God has chosen to work through men and women, boys and girls, not some corruption of human logic. Human life is sacred to God, and God loves us unconditionally. No person can or will ever love us like God loves us. Why? Because He created us. The Bible says in Genesis 2 and verse 7, And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground, and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living soul. When humans were created, they were unique from all of other 
the creation of the animals and things that God created. They were, they were unique because they were the only thing created in God's image. And sadly, this truth has been lost in our society today. Many people believe that humans are nothing more than overdeveloped animals. Some clowns even believe that they evolved from apes. How sad to take that precious uh, creation of God and, and turn it into something that God never intended it to be. God intended for us not to be expendable pieces of flesh or an overdeveloped monkey. This science so-called has brought also the thought process of humanity that human beings are valuable only if they can contribute to society. We're seeing in the medical community now this thought process where, hey, once a human being has got to a certain age and they no longer can contribute, we just cast them aside and, and eventually even euthanize them so that they won't be a burden on us who can contribute and do what we're supposed to do. That is not of God. God values all human life sacredly. The, the theology of assisted suicide has caused society's view of life uh, in humans to be uh, likened unto dogs and cats. You know, you don't want them to suffer, you know. You know. How many times have you heard people say, well, I'm taking my dog to the vet because it's got you know, arthritis, it can't get around, and, and you know, we, we feel like it would be better to put the dog... You know, that's a dog, okay? But we're not talking about humans here. What's good for a dog and a cat is not equally good for humans. Euthanasia has found its way solidly into the medical community, and, and it's even an accepted treatment for terminally ill people today. I've sat by the bed of people who were terminally ill, and they were on their last few days, and maybe even their last few hours, and I've sat there and I've watched as the nurses come in, and most of the time, the prescribed way is morphine. And morphine, if it's given in high enough dose, will shut the body down. If you've ever watched a person who's been terminally ill, and they're on their last few hours of life, you watch the nurses every time they come in. You know, they don't want them to suffer, so what do they do? They keep cranking up the morphine and increasing its flow and increasing its flow. And they'll go out for an hour or two, and they'll come back in, and they'll say, Oh, boy, it looks like he's close now. Click it up some more. I understand there's some times where we need to make folks comfortable if they're in pain, and I'm not opposed to that. But I've watched that so many times. I often wonder, what would happen to that person if they weren't hooked up to morphine? I don't know. We trust the medical community to do what is right, and they take an oath to preserve life. But those same doctors will, without a thought, take away a human life in the process of abortion. To me, that's a contradiction of terms, and it's against the Sixth Commandment, by the way. A society that cannot discern between uh, the value of a dog or a cat and human life has lost touch with the Bible's teaching on God's most prized possession. When the discussion of the Sixth Commandment comes up, oftentimes we hear three controversial arguments surrounding it. Number one is war and its consequences. Number two, capital punishment. And number three, abortion. You know, the peace pickles will tell you that there's never a need for war. We can all just get along. Live and let live, they say. Well, can I tell you, that's not the world we live in. We have people today that would sooner kill us if they could and get away with it because of what we're standing for and sitting for this morning. Because we sit for the Christian, uh, uh, the, the faith of Christ and, and belief in Christ and belief in God the Creator, because we sit here this morning and believe this, there's people in the world that don't want us to just sit and let live. If they could kill us this morning and get away with it, they would do exactly that because of what we stand for. Americans better wake up because it's quickly coming to this place as well. War and its consequences are found throughout the pages of the Bible. Uh, we find many instances where God sanctioned, clearly sanctioned war uh, because of Satan's revolt in heaven and Adam's disobedience in the garden. Evil exists in this world. And for us to think that evil is not existent and we can all just get along is not reality, according to the Word of God. Righteous warfare is a tool designed by God to stamp out evil and to protect righteousness in the world. 
War and peace and fighting wars against evil are a necessary commodity that God has put in place. And we have a responsibility as Christians when we see evil is to stamp it out. First of all, by the witness of Christ, and if that won't work and they continue to resist and fight and try to take the lives of innocent Christian people, we have a right to stand back and fight. And I believe God is perfectly okay with that. The second common argument that we find regarding the Sixth Commandment and Thou Shall Not Kill is capital punishment. Those same folks who will allow a baby to be almost born yet they're perfectly okay with a late-term abortion, seeing the baby delivered and then killing the doctor killing the baby there in the delivery room, those same folks are totally opposed to capital punishment. Many of the same opponents of war will also tell you that capital punishment is breaking the Sixth Commandment. And the reason they say it is because they do not understand the Bible or choose willfully to forget that God himself sanctioned capital punishment. Leviticus chapter 24 verse 17 says this, And he that killeth any man shall surely be put to death. That's God's word. Capital punishment is clearly an accepted method of curbing bad human behavior with regard to the crime of murder and other heinous crimes against humanity. Think about it this way. If a person is convicted of a capital murder and they are allowed just to have a prison sentence and then eventually get paroled, the chances are very good that they're coming back to society and they'll perform again. Uh, several years ago, uh, while we were living in Virginia on Christmas Day, Christmas uh, morning, there was a family that lived in the outside of Richmond there, just a little bit outside the city limits. And two, two men decided to show up at their house on Christmas morning. And they both uh, went into the house. They killed the father. They killed the mother. They killed the children. And when the little girl that was visiting her friend came home from visiting her friend on an overnight stay, came home Christmas morning to thinking she was coming home to her parents and a Christmas morning and the tree and all those things that we do at Christmas time, instead she walked in to the hands of two despicable human being murderers. They tortured and killed her as well. They left the house, but when they were leaving the house, they set the house on fire. And the courts in Virginia sentenced those men to death by execution. See, one thing we can know for sure, when we sentence those types of, uh, of criminals to death, we can know this for sure, they're never going to do it again. And that's, I believe, why God intended capital punishment to be a part of human society. hypocrisy of the liberals of our society, the same opponents of war and capital punishment, have absolutely no problem murdering an unborn child in its mother's womb. God's judgment cannot be held back on a society that has murdered millions of babies. We better mark it down. God's judgment is coming. God's judgment is coming to America. If this process of murdering the unborn continues, God will not stand by and let it continue. You know, you think, well, geez, well, how many millions have to die? I'm not sure about that, but I know this. God's not going to stand for it, and there will be a price to pay for what has happened. Going back to the beginning of time, when we find uh, Cain and Abel the first two babies that were born into existence in the world. It wasn't long before those two boys decided that they couldn't get along and Cain took the life of Abel because of jealousy. We think that we as a society are continuing to get better and better. Abortion clearly rises to the level of first degree murder. In Vermont Title 13, Chapter 53, Subsection 2301 says this, Murder committed by means of poison, or by lying in wait, or by willful, deliberate, and premeditated killing is guilty of murder in the first degree. That's a perfect description of abortion. 
perfect description of abortion, yet it continues without any checks. When mankind decides to take human life without a biblical reason, they violate the Sixth Commandment. Abortion is a clear and concise violation of that Sixth Commandment. Most often when that commandment is broken, it comes out because peace between humans is severed. The struggle for peace between humans has been long ongoing for centuries. And as a matter of fact, since humans were born into existence, I just told you about Cain and Abel. Adam and Eve's first children. From the moment that those two boys were able to function on their own and began to take part in worship, problems with peace came almost immediately. I understand most Christians will never commit the act of murder in the most literal sense. And you say that, well, all the hoopla over this command, what's the big deal? We're Christians. We're not going to commit murder. What are you talking about, preacher? Matthew chapter 5 and verse 21 and 22 makes it clear. Turn over to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. Look, if you will, at verse 21. The Bible says, Ye have heard that it was said by them of old time, Thou shalt not kill. And whosoever shall kill shall be in danger of judgment. But I say unto you that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of judgment. And whosoever shall say to his brother, Raka, there shall, uh, shall be in danger of the council, but whosoever... Uh, shall say, Thou fool shall be in danger of hellfire. Jesus makes it clear here that the sixth commandment is broken when we speak harshly to each other. When we speak harshly, when we speak angrily, and, and, and we use those, those angry words to one another as Christians and as human beings, we are in a sense... Uh, killing each other with words. And that word raka there means youthless and wor- uh, useless and worthless. And, and when we look at a person and we say, hey, you're no longer any valuable, you're, you're youth- useless, you're, you're worthless, what in the world are you even in my life for? You're, you're worthless to me. You've broken the sixth commandment. When we in anger call on someone that way and say that they're of no value God has created them and and we're getting to a place in our mind where we can call them and say that they're of no value. We violated, I believe, the spirit of the sixth commandment. And the Bible says are in danger of judgment. John says over in 1 John 3 and verse 15, hatred of brethren is also a violation. Look over there, 1 John chapter 3. 1 John chapter 3. Look, if you will, at verse 15. The Bible says here, Whosoever hateth his brother is a murderer. And ye know that no murderer hath eternal life abiding in him. Whosoever hateth his brother is a murderer, and ye know that no murderer hath eternal life abiding in him. You know the old saying that sticks and stones may break my bones, but names will never hurt, or words will never hurt? That's not accurate. Our words and the verbal treatment of another person can damage them for life. How many times have you met children that have been browbeaten by their parents to a point where they have no confidence and they go into adulthood like little zombies? not able to stand up, not able to speak up, always afraid that they're going to be beat down if they raise a voice. Much of the modern world's philosophy began with this problem many thousands of years ago in a place called Babylon. Mankind decided to build a tower to reach towards heaven, and man's attempt to be like like the Most High God In that society, a brick was more precious than human life. You know when they were in the process of building that tower and a brick was to be dropped and smashed on the ground, the people there would mourn over that? 
Because every time a brick was broken, it meant that we had to build another brick to get to the tower building and to reach toward heaven. And, but at the same time, when, when, when men were killed, history tells us men were killed building that tower, they were just brushed aside and the work continued. This philosophy that man has of man and the value that society has placed on human beings is not new. It's come on down through the centuries. The purpose of this philosophy became more important than the Creator of mankind. The laws that God has put in place have now taken a back seat and they've been trumped by the laws of man. Al Gore's Mother Earth philosophy is born out of these same ancient customs from Babylon. Humans are relegated to second place in priority behind everything else. You know, the humpback whale is more valued than humans. Did you know that? Spotted owl. Any other crazy assumptions that the world has created apart from God's laws of creation and priority? You know, there's some places today where you have to come to a complete stop in the highway to let the frogs cross. And if you run those frogs down and the right person is there and sees you do it, you probably are going to go to jail. That's where we've come. It's, it's crazy. And it continues to get crazier. When society devalues human life, the life of man created by God in the image of God, there is nothing else it will do, not do. When society is allowed to go unchecked and continue to uh, develop laws that put those types of things uh, in the place where only humans belong, uh, that just tells us that, that, that very quickly we're moving down a slippery slope and it will not be long before we start pushing folks uh, off the cliff in the wheelchair, literally, because they're of no value. You know, the world's overpopulated. That's what they'll tell you. But to tell us that would mean that God didn't understand how humans were going to be in the future and, and the earth that he created was not big enough to house everybody. That's such a silly thing. Drive over to Texas sometime. and Drive out of any city or community in Texas and what do you find? Open nothingness. That's only in one place. Drive in Florida. A place that everybody seeks to go when things get cold. And there are certain places in Florida that you can drive for miles and there's nothingness. But yet humans are crowded to the point where we can't live anymore without doing away with some folks. It's just crazy. How many of you have ever seen the Creation Museum? No one. I haven't either. I hope to. But I have read a lot of the articles on it. And you know, sad truth is, when you read the articles on it, and you read the reviews, you have a lot of Christian people that have visited, and they'll say things like, well, this was a very good display, very... Uh, very well done. It really shows God's handiwork and God's creation and the ark was an incredible thing to see and, and all those things. And then there's some that are not Christians and they'll say things like, nice place, but based on no science. Nice place, but no science. Uh, really good place to take kids if you want to entertain them for a little while with some, some fantasy type displays here's the truth. Those folks are the ones wrong. But you see, society has conditioned people's thinking and conditioned in, in their minds to such a point that they will believe a lie that they've heard a hundred times rather than the truth they've heard once. That is the society that we live in. When society devalues the life of man that was created in the image of God, there's nothing else that it will not stoop to. Did you know that the legislature this week is mulling around the idea of creating safe spaces for heroin addicts? So if they want to be a heroin addict, they'll let them come to a certain place, they'll give them the right kind of stuff and the right kind of things to do, use, and they can inject safely. 
What is wrong? What is wrong with this society that we will go to those levels? See, the experts will tell you, oh, we're helping them. We're providing them a safe place. See, because we know that if we don't provide them a safe place, then they'll do it anyway, and they'll do it unsafely. And I say, take it away and let them sweat it out. These things that society is trying to quickly, uh, they're trying to sweep God's word away and, and sweep the laws of God away and, and replace them with their own human logic is just, it's just, it's evil. All of those that place a low value on something where God places a high value are in error. It's as simple as that. It's not complicated, it's as simple as that. See, we cannot take it upon ourselves to trust our own judgment over the Creator. But that's what happens every time. God calls on us to live a life of faith. Trusting in His Word, trusting in the precepts, the principles that He gives us. And, and when we take it upon ourselves to push the truth away and live our life according to the way we believe it should be, most times we end up in error. That's how those folks got to that place at the heroin center to begin with. Trying to go their own way. Not trusting on what God's Word had to say. Not trusting on what God says was best for them. But trusting in themselves instead. Turn over to Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11. This is a very familiar chapter. We talked about it this morning in Sunday school, but I think it's appropriate for here. Hebrews chapter 11. The Bible says in verse 1, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it the elders obtained a good report. Through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God. See, God spoke this whole thing into existence in a matter of words. So that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. In other words, God didn't have it to be so that, so that uh, when He created the world and created this whole uh, place that we live, he, he didn't leave it up to us to, to do certain things on our own. He did it for us. By faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous. God testifying of his gifts, and by it, he being dead, yet speaketh. By faith. Those of us that are Christians live by faith. We live by the faith of the Word of God. And we live by the faith knowing full well that what God says for us is true. And we don't need to rework it. We just take it as it is. Take it for what it says. We don't have to change it. We just read it. We, we live it. And the Bible says that's what Abel did. And God said he was righteous. His sacrifice was accepted above his brother. Why? Because Abel lived according to the word of God. And it was counted to him for righteousness. He was counted righteous by God. Think about it this way. Do, we, do you this morning as a Christian, do you want to, at the end of your time here, when God calls you to heaven and you pass on from this life, do you want to be looked upon as a person that was righteous? Well, if we do, I hope you do, the Bible said we've got to trust God on this. And when we begin to take human life randomly, as we see fit, as we think it ought to be, we are in violation of one of God's most sacred commandments, Thou shalt not kill. And God will not hold us blameless if we're in violation. We have to trust the Lord for a lot of things. We trust Him with our safety. We trust Him with our homes. We trust Him with, with the things that He's provided us. By the way, they're all His things. None of it is ours. God allows us to manage those, those things. 
God allows us to manage the lives of others, and we call them children. God gives each of us children, and He allows us to manage those young people, and, and, he, and he, he, he commands us in the Word to bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. And that means we teach them the principles. We teach them the commandments. We teach them that thou shalt not kill. And as we teach them and we bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord, we're preparing the next generation of Christians. But you know, there's some folks that think that those commandments are antiquated. They're of no more value. We can take them down in the courthouse because, ah, they're offensive. What they do is they point towards sin. And as humans, none of us likes to be pointed out as a sinner. But I believe God gave us those commandments and we have the Word of God to keep us on the straight path. And if we want to sweep all of this away and and remove all the evidence, like it says there in Hebrews, the evidence of things not seen, and, and it's like I told the young folks this morning, faith is always based on fact. Fact of the Word of God. Any faith that cannot be, re, uh, cannot be uh, backed up by the Word of God is, is fallacy. Faith is based on God's Word. And as Christians, that's what God's holding us accountable to. But if we think that we are going to get away with devaluing human life and just brushing it aside as inconvenient, we have another thing coming. And I believe God's judgment is coming. I would not want to be in the place of some of these human rights uh, abortion activists that say it's okay, it's a woman's choice and all this other stuff. And I understand, hey, a woman's body is a woman's body and all that. But can I tell you this? The baby inside that body is not their own. And if God has allowed it to be there, He's expecting. He's not hoping. He's expecting that it's going to be treated the way He would treat it. We need to be praying diligently that this society will turn back. We're we're running out of time. Every day that goes by, the society moves closer and closer and closer to becoming godless. Godless. If it were not for the folks here this morning and other folks in other churches of faith like this, the Christian witness would be gone. Because the majority of society doesn't want it. They don't want to hear it. They don't want to be around it. And if they could stamp it out completely, and if they could pass laws in America that would say it would be illegal to preach what I'm preaching this morning, they would do it. We've got to speak up. We've got to start letting our voices as Christians be heard because we're quickly, fastly approaching a slippery slope. And once we start down that slippery slope, there'll be no turning back. Stand with me if you would for prayer this morning. Father, we do pray this morning that you might help us to see see things as you see things. Lord, help our minds to be focused on what your word has to say. And Lord, help us, we pray, to see things through the eyes that you see things. And that's the only way it is to be. And Father, help us this morning to not try to conform you to our logic. But help us, Father, this morning to conform ourselves to what you would have us to be. And Father, that comes from us being diligent students of your word. And Father, I pray this morning, if there be one here that is not sure that they would go to heaven if they were to pass away today, that today might be the day that they might surrender their self to you. Father, help us now as we have this time of invitation. Have the, have the preeminence in all the hearts here, Lord. Guide and direct as you see fit. And we'll be careful to thank you, Lord, for all that you accomplished. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen.